Vic Meisinger, United States Army, Vietnam. Vic enlisted into the military, into the Airborne in the 60s and ended up in the Warrant Officer Program learning to fly helicopters in Vietnam. He was assigned to the 334th Armed Assault Helicopter Company and then transferred to the 1st Air Cavalry, 2nd of the 20th and 3 Corps. Vic was a Cobra gunship pilot and just tells an incredible story about the helicopter itself, about his assault missions in Vietnam and just gives us another unique perspective of Vietnam. It's just a great story. I want to thank Michael Swarovski again for helping me sponsor these stories. Michael, thank you. This is another one that you've sponsored and uh, many people are going to learn about Vic's um, service in Vietnam because of you. So thank you for helping me, Michael, in your support of our country and our veterans and I just greatly, greatly appreciate it. God bless you for that. I do want to mention that I did interview Vic in Longmont, Colorado. Over 16 years ago, it was April 7, 2007, he was among a group of veterans that were there. Some of the stories I've featured on this channel, but um, so Vic's still with us today and going strong and I hope that I can see him again soon. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story, there's information in the video description. I encourage you to click on the link and then on my website, Sponsor a Vet, click on that link and it'll show you pictures of my veterans and I hope if you've been thinking about sponsoring a story I would encourage you to do so folks it's very very noble for you to help me present these stories and it's your help that allows me to do this like Michael and others have that have stepped forward if you'd like to donate to my work there's information in the comments section of every one of my videos I'm gonna stop for a moment and I'm gonna spotlight somebody out there John Penn John, you're out there, you're a truck driver in the United States, and I thank you for what you do as a truck driver. About a year and a half ago, I, I had signs that said, thank you truck drivers. I still have the signs and stickers that say, thank you truck drivers. The backbone of America, folks. We, they're so underappreciated. Everything in your home, your car, and the gas that goes in your car, it's because of a truck driver. So I wanna sh give a shout out to truck drivers. Thank you for your service to our country. What you do, it's so, so important, so very important. The series on my website is called Keep America Moving, if you want to watch some of those videos where I, I interacted with truck drivers for about three months, a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago. So John, thank you. I want to thank John Penn for being a sponsor of my work. John, it, it's not unnoticed. It, it's not, people, it's because of you that I'm able to do what I'm doing, John. And I just really want to look in this camera and say thank you. I love you, brother. Love you in the Lord. Thank you for your service to our country, like I said, as a truck driver. And, your support of my work. There's so many things that go on behind the scenes, folks, and John's helping me do those. And because of him, I'm able to bring these stories to you. So God bless you, John. I salute you, sir. Amen. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you for watching and subscribing to this channel. And thank you for listening to Voices of History Radio, which has been tuned in in over 40 countries across the world, folks. Voices of History Radio, KBOH, Grand Junction, Colorado is going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Listeners support it. God bless all of you who have stepped forward there. That's another platform that it's a sister station of this YouTube channel. So very comforting to hear these stories. So many people are being helped. So many heartfelt letters coming in about how these stories are therapeutic and that they just, people are learning so much. They're, they're gaining so much knowledge of what our veterans have gone through and the freedoms that we have and how embedded in these stories are why we're free today. Amen. Okay, I'm going to stop now, but thank you for listening to Voice of History Radio. And uh, Vic's story will be on there after it airs here. So share these videos and uh, tune into my next broadcast. God bless you.
me again. Uh, I may repeat some of the questions, but what year were you in Vietnam? I was there June of 68 to June of 69. Okay, and you enlisted? I enlisted uh, to go airborne, but I qualified for the warrant officer program once I got into the military. I had dyslexia all the way through school, so I didn't like school and I didn't understand what it was, but the military caught it right away and explained it to me, and then from then on, uh, life opened up. I graduated number two in the flight class, so. Where'd you go to training? Pri primary training was at Fort Walters, Mineral Wells, okay. Texas, and then Fort Walters, or uh, Fort Rucker in uh, Dothan, Enterprise, Alabama, and then I went to Cobra training in Savannah Beach, Georgia. So when you're in training, Vic, are you thinking of Vietnam? Are they training you and saying you're going to be in combat? And you know, is that what the goal is? Is to get you ready for that? And go to Vietnam? A absolutely, yeah, yeah. It was a real volunteer thing, and I enlisted to be airborne anyway, so I knew I was going to be a ground pounder. I I wanted to go to Vietnam. You know, we were all very patriotic, and uh, well, most of us were. <laughs> so we wanted to to serve and protect and do the things that our fathers did and our grandfathers did. Excellent. Tell me about arriving in country the first time. What, what was, was the geography of Vietnam what you thought it would be? It was very interesting uh, because when the plane landed, it was just, when we got off the plane, it was just prior to noon. And at noon in Tonsonut, uh, the, uh, the noon sirens go off. So we're brand new and all of a sudden sirens are going off. and We're all kind of looking at each other, wondering which way to run, you know. And, and then all the other guys who were there just looked at us and pointed at us. I guess it was a funny thing to do and just make fun. The, uh, the, the geography was relatively flat there in Three Corps. I'm from Denver here, Denver, Colorado. And uh, of course we have mountains, so I wasn't that used to a lot of flat land. Down in Texas in training I saw a lot of that. But it was, it was very beautiful. It was uh, similar to the topography and, and stuff in Georgia and Florida and those areas. So you were with the 1st Cavalry? I was with the 334th Armed Assault Helicopter Company first. I was shot and then I transferred to the 1st Cav. What battalion and company? I was with the 2nd of the 20th ARA, Aerial Rocket Artillery. We were all Cobras. So we were just pure guns assigned to all of 3 Corps. Anybody who got in trouble, the horn went off and we went. And you said you were 18? I was 20 when I first started flying there. I uh, turned 21 after I'd been shot. So you're a young man, you're, you're, you're patriotic, you want to serve your country, you're over in Vietnam, and you're assigned to a unit, and uh, I, I, did you receive a baptism under fire, as it were, or if, did you feel invincible, and, and or did you receive a, a baptism under fire, for lack of better words, and realizing you could get killed doing this stuff? Or? All the above. I, I very well remember the first time I got shot at. I was fl flying co-pilot in a Charlie model gunship on a night mission. And as we rolled in on a quad 50 that was shooting up at us, I literally froze on the gun system I was shooting because I was in such awe at these bullets coming up at me, looking like basketballs on fire. And they just would just come right up at you and just go right past you. And it was just in awe. And my aircraft commander apprised me of the situation, said, don't do that again. Shoot back, please, this next time around. And, and then uh, once you got over it, it was, it was really an adrenaline rush. It was, it was incredible. Hard to explain. Tell me about the Cobra, what it's equipped with, and who's on board. In the Cobra, you have two pilots, two officers. Uh, your front seat is normally the aircraft, uh, or the, the uh, assistant commander. The aircraft commander sits in the back. Uh, the fellow up front has the TAT system. He has pretty much control of the movable weapons, the mini guns, the, uh, the chunkers, we call it the 40 millimeter, it's a grenade launcher. The aircraft commander in the back pretty much fires everything in a stowed and locked position. So you have to point the nose. You're literally flying into whatever you want to shoot at, whether it's weapons firing up at you or personnel or, or anything like that. And gee, in the Cobra we carried <laughs> I believe it was 76 pair of rockets, 4,000 rounds of minigun, uh, I think 400 rounds of uh, 40 millimeter. So it was, it was quite an attack helicopter. So when the grunts or the guys on the ground are telling me they're calling in gunships, is this what comes in? Absolutely, yeah. And we, the beauty of the helicopter 
is you were just able to, to literally get so close to the ground. Many times we would come in and, and clip the trees or, or, or uh, I mean, get real close to the dikes and, and the rice paddies and stuff. I mean, come in really low, really fast. You would surprise them and the enemy and you would also scare them because that's an awful, awful looking machine coming at you that fast. So as far as a combat assault, Hueys and troops being transported, inserted into a landing area, um, are the gunships in first to clear out the LZ and then come in the, the troops? With the first cab, normally what we would do is they would prep with artillery. We were also called aerial rocket artillery because we carried so many rockets and we were also trained to be forward observers so we could act as the liaison between what's happening on the ground. We were the eyes for seeing what was there, then we would call in coordinates to adjust for heavier ar artillery. But then we were there on site just in case maybe our intelligence wasn't good. We thought there was a small group of the enemy and there was a really large group, so we were able to, as soon as the, the slicks they were called, would come in and drop the troops off. If they received contact, we were on them right away. And we were, we were so fast and had so many people on station, we would have constant turnarounds. Many times our missions would only last two minutes because that's how, about how long it would take you to expend everything you had. And by then your next team's coming in and they just fall in right behind you. So when you guys are, are getting ready to take off, um, am I saying a right combat assault? Is that for the mission? Well, pretty much. We, we, we were just sitting around. We had a hot status. We had a, a yellow status and a blue status. Um, the hot guys, you slept with your clothes on. You had two minutes response time from the time that the, the horn went off. Then you're supposed to be airborne in two minutes and on your way. While you're buckling up, the other guy is writing coordinates and stuff. So you're constantly on the move, getting out there as quickly as you can. But you sleep in your clothes, your combat gear, and you're just ready to go. You never knew where you were going to go in my unit with rare exception. So you're, how many, how many uh, gunships would go on a, on a mission? And then are they, you being followed by the Hueys? There, there's a light fire team, that's two. Heavy fire team would be three. Uh, there are, are a bunch of other kinds of missions. You had hunter-killer missions where you would lose, or use a loach. Uh, normally a, a Hughes 500 would be the little bird. He'd be down on the deck. He'd be trying to draw fire while the other cobra would be up there on top just waiting for it to happen. As soon as he received fire, he'd pop smoke and then the cobra would roll in right away. Sometimes there'd be two cobras. That'd be the hunter-killer teams. Our unit wasn't that. We were just strictly all guns, heaviest stuff we could carry. Just for real heavy combat. Okay, now are you, and you're uh, aircraft commander or assistant? Or? I was aircraft commander. You said you sat in the back? Sat in the back, yeah. You're tandem. Okay, okay. It's just like a fighter in the Air Force. So I'm learning more about the Cobra because most of the stuff I've heard or seen or listened to were the Hueys. And I don't hear a whole lot about the Cobra. I hear about the gunships, but nobody can describe this. But um, it seems like you, you see more historically about the Hueys, maybe I'm not looking at the right resources, but I see a lot of the Hueys, some Chinook, some, some, uh, some uh, loaches, and then I do see the Cobras too, but I don't hear as much about the Cobra gunships as I do the Hueys. We were, we were pretty rare. Yeah. Um, they were called snakes affectionately because they really had the strike capacity, um, carried all kinds of weapons, but it was, it, it was a rare bird at the time. Yeah, like I said, when I went to the first CAV, we were the first unit in three corps there to go all Cobras. My other unit, the 334th, had Cobras and uh, Hueys, the, the Bravo and Charlie model gunships. So is there an adrenaline rush when you when you scramble, you get up, you go, I mean, and, and then how about wind you down after, so afterwards? I mean, is it, tell me about the adrenaline and how... Well, <clears throat> I can tell you it's addicting because once I got back it never left. Uh, that's why I had to stay in flying and I was in the race cars and hang gliders and anything that was a thrill of some sort was my cup of tea. Yeah, it was the ultimate rush. Uh, those who were really there found out soon that uh, it was the scariest thing you did but it was also the biggest rush you ever had in your life. And then when you really got into combat and you really saved lives, it really meant a lot. Then you really understood where the training came in and what it was for. Were you ever used the time to insert or take wounded out or anything like that? 
I actually had to do that uh, with the Cobra. It was, it was just a real bad situation. There's no place to put them on the Cobra, but the ammo bay doors will pop out. And the, we were in such a hurt that we had to use the Cobras to, to get some guys out once. So these aren't, these, aren't, uh, <coughs> these aren't Bell helicopters? Yes, they are Bells. Yes, yeah, wonderful machines. They're only 36 inches wide. Really incredible, very fast. Um, you, you mentioned to me on the phone, I believe, you said it was the best and the worst year of your life. Explain that and why. You did so much growing up. You lost friends. Uh, when I was shot, I wasn't certain whether I was going to live or not, so there's a while there where you aren't certain. So you, you lose a lot of, lot of friends, you uh, risk a lot, but you also have the greatest camaraderie you'll ever have in your life. That's why a lot of the guys came back and go into the police work and go into the fire departments and things like that. They want to help, but they want to be in tight groups again. Um, it also made me more appreciative of life. There hasn't been a day since Vietnam really where I've had a bad day. You know, when I look back, I always say, well, they aren't shooting at me today, you know, so can't get, you know, too much worse. And it's given me a real good attitude on life. All those who know me now are amazed that I'm just a happy camper and have been forever. And that's the reason. You come so close to death so often and you watch it right next to you. It's and the camaraderie within your group was, was tight? Absolutely. Combat brings you together in a way that you just can't imagine. There are no race lines. When the bullets are flying and the stuff is really hitting the fan, there's no Mexican, there's no black, there's no Caucasian. You are just all brothers and sisters. Now, we didn't have women in, in the trenches or on the combat lines in Vietnam, as I know they have them now, but I guarantee you it's the same. You know, you're just brothers and sisters when it's hitting the fan. You're there to help each other and hug each other and get each other out of the trouble. So you have one tour, one year. Mm -hmm. Is there, I've talked to a lot of guys on the ground, when they get there, they're called newbies or cherries or whatever, and I guess they're more prone to possibly getting wounded or killed than some of the guys. Is it like that in the aviation units too? I mean, is the new guy coming in, are there a lot of replacements coming in? or? Depends on the unit. The, um, when my first unit, the 334th, everyone was rotating early on. So I became an aircraft commander. The guys who came in with me became aircraft commanders really early on with very little training. We had about six weeks in country and we were aircraft commanders. Normally you'll be in a unit and you'll get three, four, or five months of training before they make you an aircraft commander. So it just depends. And then also if the other guys are shot and you just need replacements. And by the way, we were called FNGs. <laughs> I've heard that before. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, with the Hueys, a lot of the times the, the guys will tell me that you, hearing a Huey was either a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon the mission. I mean, you know, it could be coming to take them out or take them back in, and um, they had like a love-hate relationship with the Huey. I've heard that referenced. I've heard things like it was the, the Huey helicopter, I'm talking about this helicopter, is the most, un, the, uh, most undecorated soldier in Vietnam or something like that, and how it was used. I'm sure that the gunships were, were just as much important as far as the success of, of what we had to do in Vietnam. Well, I had nothing but uh, good comments from the guys in the field who came back after missions. A lot of times they'd come up, wake you up, and hug you with tears in their eyes. Hey, you saved my butt, buddy. Thank you, sir. And it was wonderful. That was wonderful. Did you lose any close friends during your tour there? Yeah. Were yeah. you with them, or did you hear about them getting shot, or what had happened to them? In the same fire teams. Um, a lot of accidents happened too. One of my roommates from the 334th uh, got out of his helicopter. I didn't know it was him. He was in a loach. And as he got out, he didn't friction the collective down. And the aircraft had a spring-loaded collective or, or a light collective. And the aircraft lifted up and just completely rotated on top of him. All I saw him do was put his hands up to protect himself from the rotor blades. So all kinds of strange things like that happen. Um, accidental shootings, you know. but. And we also had, you know, a lot of combat injuries, too. And it's, you try not to dwell on it, you know, they happen, and you just move on. Who, who are you fighting at your tour, B, BC, the North Vietnamese? There was no face, there was no name. They were just the bad guys. 
I didn't know anything about Vietnam. They gave us, gave us a little pamphlet, you know, here, it's where you're going. And it looked like a little coloring book, kind of, you know, and told you a little bit about the culture. Very few of us knew much about it. We were just patriotic boys. Our government said go, our fathers did before, so we went. And they were the enemy, that's all we knew. They were the enemy, they were the guys shooting at us. So if they're shooting at us, they're the bad guys we're gonna shoot back. And if we're bigger and better and faster, then we're gonna win. Were you shot at a lot of times, the aircraft was hit? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So just maybe take me on one of those missions and what it sounded like, what happened, and how you got out of it. Well, when the aircraft is hit, it's a little tinging sound, like a little hammer on the side of the aircraft, unless you can see the bullet holes through the plexiglass or if you get hit. When I was hit, it came right through the front of the aircraft, and so saw everything. It came right through the chin bubble, up into the chest area, was hit in hand, blew the cyclic apart. So I saw that one really well. It was real close, right on takeoff. The other ones, uh, like I said, you'll be flying along, just ting, 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 you, know, you get hit, you know, so. I never had anything where anything really blew up in the cockpits, thank goodness. So. You know, as far as, you know, being that, at that age as the aircraft commander, that's pretty young. I mean, the responsibilities that you had, obviously there was a great need in, in Vietnam for pilots. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Warrant Officer program was my saving grace because I wasn't very much into academics at all. Um, you had to have a four-year degree normally to be a pilot. And then because of the Vietnam War kicking in, they lowered it to a two-year associate degree. And then the need was so great, they even lowered it to high school a graduate, but you still had to pass the, all the requirements and the tests that the other, other guys with college degrees had to, had to do. And so I luckily passed, and that's how I got into the Warrant Officer Program, as did so many other guys my age. You felt a great need to serve your country, you're over there. Are you conscious of, of that fact when you're there, or is it just a matter of survival? Oh, no, you're very conscious. Yeah, you're very conscious. And, and we would get news from back home, and we had the AFVN TV station, so we knew what was happening back there. And the protests and things uh, against the war didn't settle with us too well, because it's, it's a different thing when you're over there, you know. Um, the people here in the States had, had the opportunity to to vote and complain and, and to march and protest, and, and we didn't. We were there. We had a mission, and our mission was to stay alive and keep our, our friends and our family alive. And we really believed in what we were doing. It wasn't until much later we found out that we were kind of hornswoggled a bit. Why, did, why does Vietnam refer to as an unpopular war? Oh, goodness, for so many reasons. First, we lost so many men. Uh, gee, I believe it's 56,000 plus. Um, it lasted forever. Uh, it didn't seem to go anywhere. And when you saw the conditions that everyone was living in, even we started questioning why we were there. And, and what are we doing? This place is just, this is not a good place to fight a war. No place is a good place to fight a war, but uh, the jungle in Vietnam was, was pretty rough and tough. And, and the division of the country back here regarding the war, it's almost like what's happening today, it's unfortunate, but, uh, and that had a, a part to play in your morale, like you said, probably a little bit, but, uh, but you can stay focused. How did you guys wind down after missions and having a hard day? Um, what would you do to uh, the de-stress or debrief? I mean, how, how would you wind down? Well, it's, uh, in our unit, uh, we were all gung-ho baby John Wayne's uh, volunteer and just crazy to go do anything and everything that we were called upon to do. We also drank a lot of beer. Um, we had our own little little officers club. It was made of a tent and uh, ammo boxes and stuff, but we, we drank a lot of Schlitz and you know, every once in a while somebody had sent us a six pack of Coors from Denver here and we'd all sit around and take sips of it and stuff. But, Mostly just beer. We were in the jungle. You couldn't do much. And uh, you, you slept and you paid attention to what was happening. Yeah. Is Vietnam still a pretty big part of your life or is it something that happened almost 40 years ago and you just forget about it? Oh, you never forget about it. Not once you've really been in combat. It stays with you forever, but that's the part that makes you a better person. Because once you live through it, you're, like I said, you're so appreciative of everything else. How did it change you going into the military, 
going through Vietnam, coming home, how, did that change you? I think you said probably for the better, but as a person, did you become cynical or did you just, you, like you said, you appreciated life more and, and it was all positive for you? Well, for me personally, um, it was positive there that I appreciated life, but also it, it made it a little difficult for me to actually participate in long-term relationships because you never thought you were going to be around long. I never expected to live as long as, long as I have now, especially flying 25 years after Vietnam. Um, I've lost so many friends in the industry one way or the other, and that's without Vietnam. And in Vietnam, losing them to, to combat. So you just don't really think you're going to be around that long, and then you, you tend to be a little more self-centered and a little more concerned about what you're going to do with your life, and I'm going to, you know, I gave up over there, so I'm going to take care of things here, take care of me. So it was a little hard to pay attention to serious relationships. Most of, most of the helicopter pilots I know have gone through, you know, a marriage or two, and they, we've all shared the same sort of little problems. You think there's a reason for that? Just uh, that the change that happens in you, and I've heard that among Vietnam veterans in general. I think it's because you're living life to the fullest, and sometimes that's not always doing the right thing. You know, go play too much. You know, go hunting, go bowling, go fishing, leave the family. You know, you aren't worried about the family. Family's okay. I'll protect them, but that's not what they need. It's no longer protect and serve, it's be with your family, give to your family, and it, it was a hard transition. You come back pretty self-centered, and you had to. You had to be pretty independent. You were a, definitely a team player, but you were also a real strong individual. You had to be. What was maybe the hardest thing you had to do in Vietnam as far as your job and, and all the missions you flew? Was there a particular hard, harder situation or, or mission that you had to go on? No, okay. there were just so many. The ones, the ones that stick in your head are the ones you try and bury, and that's the ones where you lost so many of your comrades. You'll never get rid of the memory, but you try not to think about it too much. And, you, and you, I don't have conversations with too many people about it. Talking about your fellow uh, pilots or just people on the ground? Both. Yeah. Your family. In the first cab, your family. You're wearing that yellow patch with that horse on your family. doesn't make any difference. You're on the ground. You're a cook. You're a letterman. Your family. And if you're getting shot at, you're my blood. And then if I lose you, then I lose a part of me. Cav's, cav was tight. Oh, sorry, what year again were you there? 68 to 69, okay. June to June. Because I remember in 65, Johnson ordered the Air Mobile Division to Vietnam, I think, for the first time. And then we see the movie, You Were Soldiers, We Were Soldiers. And uh, did you watch that movie? Yeah. Did any of that movie remind you of Vietnam, or was it a good depiction of it? N no, not, not for me. Um, I, I enjoy watching some of those movies just for entertainment value, but no, you, no one's been able to hit it right yet. Well, wasn't that the first cab? That was the first cab, yeah. yeah. It just wasn't portrayed as, as our unit was. And we were a very, very elite special unit being all Cobras, you know. No one's ever done a movie on, on gun pilots only. So that would be a little tough. Because we were a little weird. Uh, even, even in the Army, when we came into 3 Corps, I used to bring some of the guys down to my old unit at the 334th. At the 334th, we lived in two-man hooches that had air conditioning and stereos. In the cab, we lived in bunkers and tents. And when we came down into the 334th's officer club, where we had slot machines and pool tables and stuff, you know, we were animals. We were picking fights with other officers and stuff. It was terrible, but that really happened in Vietnam. You were just constantly on edge, and I'm bigger and badder and better than you. And that's the attitude you had to have as a gunny. Good, I didn't run into you, maybe, huh? Well, I mellowed a lot. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, now, did you see the Nine News story or the paper? How did you find out about my work? I caught you on the Nine News okay. show. Um, yeah. When you saw that or heard what I was doing, what maybe prompted you to, to want to come and maybe talk with me? Because of your background. I figured you were a guy who's really researching this, and you wouldn't mind hearing the truth. A lot of people don't want to hear the truth. When I, when I came back from Vietnam, I had so many of my friends and family they, they'd come up to you and they'd bug you, well, what was it like? What was it like? And you'd finally sit and tell them and they go, 
no, it wasn't. That didn't happen. And then they would go away and leave you alone, and that was good. So after having a couple of conversations with those people, then they leave you alone, you put the pictures in the closet, and you just forget it. And you never have that conversation again unless you're really with someone who's really been there, because they won't understand. How come a lot of Vietnam veterans have suffered with post-traumatic stress uh, disorders or... I've talked to a lot of them that are under current care, and maybe, I don't know if you did or you had those problems, but was it just what they saw, or was it a different kind of war? I mean, what, what happened, you think? Or was it because they had no help when they came home and they transi no transitioning back into civilian life? I think that had a lot to do with it. Uh, you know, it, the war was absolute culture shock, you know. You're over here, and you're playing high school sports and dating girls, and next thing you know, you're over there with a gun in your hand, and people are shooting at you, and you're shooting at them, and, and it's real. And uh, there's, there's no time to transition. It happens very, very quickly. Then you come back to the States, and after you live through that for a year, and you're so happy to be back, then you come back, and then at that time, all the Vietnam veterans against the war were were in force and all the protesters and the flower power people and stuff and and they would literally spit on you and curse at you and throw things at you. That's a wrong thing to do to somebody who just came back from a combat zone. Uh, so you really had to maintain and I remember I actually had to take my uniform off so I could walk around in civvies because I was afraid I was going to get into a lot of fights and just end up in jail. Because you can't understand why these people are cursing you and calling you a warmonger and a baby killer and all these things. And you were out there just doing your job. Now, you did volunteer, but I thought that was the patriotic thing to do. I still do to this day. I think everyone should serve some way, somehow. But uh, So you come back to that. And then, like I said, you try and tell your friends and family about what really happened. And then they look at you with that deer-in-the-headlight look, you know, like, no, nah, that didn't happen. So you kind of bury it, but it's still stuck inside of you. Are you part of the Vietnam Helicopter Pilot Association? No, I'm not. I'm not. Any, anything like that? Or you... I, I pretty much just, like I said, put everything in the closet and um, take all the good I can out of it. I, I don't have any, any reg regrets about it. It was, it was a good time. Mm -hmm. It was a tough time. Are there sights, sounds, or smells today that remind you of Vietnam? Pretty much gotten over them. When I first came back, absolutely. As a matter of fact, when I first came back, I, uh, I became a flight instructor at Fort Walters, and I lived in um, Fort Worth, so we commuted. But my very first day in my apartment, it's right by Carswell Air Force Base, and they have their big jets that landed right over our our apartment and my first night in the apartment as the jets would come in you'd hear that noise I thought we were under rocket attacks again so I'm running around the apartment looking for a bunker you know so some things take a while to to fade off smells same thing but it it, it goes away it becomes tolerable so you're going into combat in, in, a, in a Cobra and you're prep, uh, prepping an LZ is that the correct words no. Uh, normally what we would do is we were called out after contact already happened. Someone's really getting hurt. Every unit would have their own guns and their own slicks and they would go in but if they found that the contact was too heavy that's when they would call us in to support their own systems. So we would normally arrive on scene and the stuff's already happening and then we would just pound the areas they told us to. So do you have specific targets? How do you know what to shoot at? We're in contact with the uh, radio telegraph operator on the ground, the RTO, and he's telling us whether he's in concert with his uh, commander, and the commander's telling him what to tell us. They'll be popping smoke in a tree line or over on this, this dike area. Um, when you identify the smoke, then you simply roll in on the smoke. Many times you don't have to worry about it. You can tell because of all the tracers coming up at you. You know exactly where to go. Um, and that's kind of how it worked. So are you, are you firing a weapon or just flying? Oh, you're firing, yeah. You're, well, you're doing both. As the aircraft commander in the back, primarily you're running the mission. As a team leader, I've got my other wing ship, so I'm coordinating with him. We're setting up our racetrack pattern, making sure we're identifying the, the proper smoke, because they got kind of tricky, too. They were monitoring our radios, and we'd say, pop a purple smoke, and all of a sudden you'd see two purple smokes. 
So you knew the bad guy had one and the good guys had one. Now you've got to figure out which one's what. Night missions were more difficult. They would normally drop a, a flashlight down inside of an M79 barrel and they would point it at the helicopter so you'd see this little red light, you know. So we had difficulty in night missions finding them and putting in close support. But we were able to get in close support 10, 15 meters sometimes. And that was tight. Were you involved with the Ashall Valley and Hammerford Hill area? No. That? No. That was way up north. Tet Offensive? No. I got there right after Tet and Three Corps. That was in January, 68. December, January. Are you, can you see the, the enemy on the ground? I mean... Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you, are you using machine guns yourself, or you have other rockets that would be... Primarily in the back rockets, but you've also got machine guns that you can fire in a stowed mode. The guy up front's the guy who's got the turret system. He, he can shoot as you're even passing targets or as you're doing 360s around him if you're doing that. Um, it was really good. You would normally just do a racetrack pattern or a figure eight. You would dive in, your wingman would be right back here. So as soon as you broke, if you started receiving fire, he's able to dive in right behind you. And there were even sometimes uh, there is one incident that I remember that was actually kind of interesting. Uh, two uh, uh, Phantoms were out there, and they were doing a racetrack pattern. And they had to have a lot more distance between them. And as soon as the one Phantom would break out, man, it, the anti-aircraft was just horrendous on this guy. Well, my wing ship, he had a malfunction with his equipment. So I'm out there all alone, but I've got all these guns. And I couldn't talk to those guys, but I just started rolling in behind them and shooting at these guys. And um, I didn't know until later that they had cameras in the back of their jets and they were actually filming me covering them. And they bought me steak dinners, you know, it was, it was kind of nice. Mm. But uh, we had, had some interesting times there. You had to be pretty creative. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to the wall in Washington, D.C.? No. I'm kind of afraid. Why? Because it'll bring back all those other memories that I've kind of put in the closet. Um, they're would, there. Would there be names that people oh, yeah. did you know on the wall? Yeah. How about on any of your missions, were you ever shot down? Was anybody in the formation shot down? Or? On September 9th, 1968, on uh, takeoff out of Coochie, we were a heavy fire team. I was the second aircraft to take off. That means there were three of us. So the first ship took off. I took off. It was a night mission. And as soon as I took off, this guy opened up on me and uh, shot me everything uh, locked up. You have hydraulics and stuff. They, they will freeze. You have a couple of, of pulls with your collective and a couple of little movements before everything locks. It's like your power steering in a car just going out. And off on my left are just a whole bunch of radio anta antennas. Must have been 60 or 70 of them. Coochie was a relay base. The aircraft locked in this position in a slow left turn and I completely went around with my lights out, just used my throttle to come back down, and we landed on a road that was about eight or 10 feet wide, and the aircraft completely froze right there. So we were just very, very lucky, very lucky. Didn't crash. Then as soon as they took me into the, to the talk, the, the bunker, and they started giving me morphine, they told somebody to go out and start the aircraft and move it off the runway. And I kept telling them not to do that. And they thought the morphine had kicked into me and I was delusional. And all I heard was they started the aircraft and I heard this horrendous crash. And they had crashed the helicopter because there were no more hydraulics. And they didn't believe me. So, it was, well, I'd been shot in morphine, so. How about any of the missions into to the landing zones? Did anybody get shot down or did you uh, lose anybody like that at those, those times? We didn't. We didn't. We didn't lose any aircraft on the ground that way. Um, Did you see any Hueys get shot down? Just oh yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. What were you seeing? Where were you at? What was happening? Medevacs. We did a lot of cover on medevacs. Those guys were real heroes. They were real heroes. They went in and, and they put everything on the line and they weren't there shooting back. And they had to get so close and just stand there, sit and duck. And uh, you would try and get in close enough to give them support, but then also you didn't want to be part of a friendly fire situation and compound the situation and shoot them. So sometimes you, you know, you're very frustrating. You could get as close as you could, but you couldn't get as close as they needed. And then to watch them sit there for a while, load people on, then to get shot and lose the aircraft and lose the crew, that was tough. 
that was really tough. That was tough. Can you see the dra the ground troops, uh, our guys being inserted? Are you are they already on the ground before you even get there to support the operation? Or no, the the few times that we did go out, where we really knew in advance we were going to make a major uh, assault into an area, a full battalion or something, then we were called in, and then you would see everything happen. Yeah, the slicks would be lined up. They'd come into the LZ. They drop the troops off, and hopefully it was a cold LZ. If it was hot, then. Well, let's get creative. Are you conscious of the fact that, you know, I know you're patriotic, you're fighting for your country, it's kill or be killed, but are you conscious of the fact that the time or later of the, maybe the, the enemy being killed, or does they even bother you? I mean, does it not bother you in the sense of hindering your work, but just in the sense of, you know, people being killed, or is that just part of war? I mean, You know, truthfully, it didn't bother me at all because I believed in what we were doing, 110%. There was no doubt in my mind. And I was out there seeing our boys being shot. And so I didn't know who it was, but they were the bad guys. It didn't, didn't take you long. And then after you're shot, if you're shot, the war becomes even more personal to you. Now I really want to get back in there. Are you counting down your days to when you leave, or did you want to leave? Oh, yeah. Everybody's got a short calendar. You bet. From the day you get there, <laughs> 363 and counting, 362, and then you get down to that last few weeks, and then things get a little tense, you know. Are you going to get out of here? Are you going to make it? At the very last mission that I took, it was, it was kind of interesting. And I volunteered for it, and it was a hot situation. On the way out, I'm questioning myself, going, why did you do this? This is your last day here. You didn't have to go. They told you you didn't have to go, but something tells you, I'm here, I'm playing. You know, I'm not a bench warmer. And then you get out, and then it's over. So when you're leaving, any regrets? Do you look back? Do you feel like you're deserting your guys? I mean, how do you feel when you leave, actually? Leave yeah, family? yeah, you're leaving family. You're concerned about them. It's almost like, well, if I leave, then who's going to take care of you, you know? Yeah, that's how macho you feel, invincible, even though you've been shot, you know? Dichotomy. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's your family. You don't want to leave them. Tell me about freedom. What does freedom mean to you as a veteran? The ability to stand up and say anything you want about our government and not be arrested or shot. The ability to go where you want. We have, we have travel privileges that most people don't understand that other people don't have. Um, opportunities. The opportunities are so abundant in America to be, be anything you want to be, to try for anything. Uh, a s financial assistance for people who want to go to school at any age. There are people in other countries that just don't have schools, period. One thing I really uh, remember a lot, because I'm a teacher now, is um, the kids over there in Vietnam, they didn't have school. A few of them did, the, the very wealthy did. But most of the kids didn't. They ran the streets. They were six and seven years old, smoking, stealing. Um, it, was, it was a terrible existence. That I will never, ever forget. And now when I'm in the, the elementary schools and I, I travel around and teach a lot, uh, I, I look in their eyes and I'm so thankful they don't have to go through this, but I wish they knew about it. Mm -hmm. I wish more people in America knew what it's really like over there. Then we wouldn't take so many things for granted. And abuse them. I agree. Vic, tell me about the price for freedom and protecting our freedoms. Boy, that's a tough one. You know, the, the, the ultimate sacrifice is giving your life, but at least that's what I always thought. But I'm learning now that that's not the ultimate sacrifice. It's, it's giving your life and then your family living with that loss, the loss of you for the rest of their lives. That goes on forever and ever and ever. You never forget losing a son, losing a daughter. And I was, I was too self-centered back then. I was only concerned about me. I thought, well, if I die, okay, I can handle it. I didn't think about the family I was leaving, my mom, my dad, aunts and uncles. And I came from a small family, but it, it, it's devastating when it happens to someone close to you. Tell me about the American flag. What does it mean and represent to you? 
oh, once again, that's, that's pure freedom. That's, uh, that's what we fought for. Uh, when I hear the Star Spangled Banner still, or God Bless America, and I see the flag just flying, uh, it'll bring me to tears. I'm just absolutely the most proud American in the world. I know we've got some little problems here, but it's still the best country in the world. And it's, it, it's making my heart palpate a little bit just talking about it now. So. I agree. What, what, what should people remember about Vietnam? Or what do you want them to remember about Vietnam? Well, that it happened, and those of us that served went there with the very best intentions of protecting those that we left behind. We didn't go there simply because we were warmongers and we just wanted to shoot things and people. That wasn't it at all. But when we, when we got there, we, we found we were a family and, and we had to protect each other. Unfortunately, then we get back and we find that, you know, a lot of the information that we were told was incorrect, as we're finding now, Iraq, Iran, and, and that's a little disturbing to me. But that's why they send young people to war, because they don't think too much about it. They just follow the directions. If they sent old men like me, we'd sit there and go, now wait a minute, can we talk about this? <laughs> can I have another cup of coffee and think about it before we go out there? And you can't do that in war when it really happens. You gotta be able to just jump and go, not question it. Is there anything about combat or what you experienced as a young man that maybe you haven't told me that maybe you thought about last night or this morning or a particular story or um, that would help what I'm trying to capture here? Well, the other, th other thing really is how much, we, how much bad we did to Vietnam. And I'm sure no matter what war we're in, there's an awful lot of bad we do over there. And a lot of it's kept undercover. We, we're real good at doing that, pulling the wool over the eyes. And uh, thank goodness we do have the press now that we didn't have over there in Vietnam. But, I mean, war is not a good place for anybody. But there are bad things that happen there that, that I don't want to think about, but I want people to be aware of. Anywhere there's war, there's carnage. And we should try and do everything we can to stay out of war. That's all. You think Vietnam was different than World War II and Korea? I don't know so much about Korea. I know it was very much different than World War II. World War II was absolutely a declared war when we were fighting. Uh, America was behind America, um, the fighting forces. So you had total support. We knew in Vietnam that we weren't getting that support. So that was a little disgruntling. We couldn't understand why they couldn't see it over here in the States our way. But we had a whole different perspective over there. So. But somehow that must have been communicated to the American people during Vietnam. True. True. I just don't know how you get the accurate word out, though. Mm -hmm. The accurate word. Because everything's covered up. Yeah. Sorry to say it, but it is. There were cover-ups in, in every unit I've ever been in for mistakes and, and things, you know. Was there much drug usage in the aviation units? I mean, you hear about some stuff in the field and stuff, but was, it, uh, was there a problem with that at all? You know, to be honest with you, um, there was a lot of drug usage. It was mostly, mostly in the enlisted ranks, the guys who were out in the field, mostly. Um, there was usage in the officer world. Very little in my aviation unit that I was aware of. And we were pretty much, I mean, you had to be way too sharp. Uh, you weren't going to risk it. I wasn't. It's just not worth it. Uh, like I said, going from a sound sleep to being airborne in two minutes, you've got to have your faculties. You've got to be on top of everything. And when you're out there and the stuff is happening, you've got to think absolutely your best. Can't have any interferences. I don't know if you can remember this, but what was there? What kind of radio communications would you have? You guys have call signs? Are there are there codes and things that you talk, or is it like, look out, here they come? Or I mean, how are you guys talking on the radios? Yeah. Okay. When um, as soon as everybody had a, a, a name or number, I was Blue Max Six Seven November, and. Um, 
you would take off, you would call your radio operator, because you don't know why you're going. The horn just went off. The horn says, get in your helicopter, just go. We'll give you the information while you're flying and buckling. And so you'd be airborne, you'd be talking to your radio uh, telegraph operator, and he'd be uh, giving you coordinates where you're going. You're going five clicks out, heading 270, whatever. You've got an ambush situation out there. Here's your contact. So he gives you a radio frequency. As soon as you get airborne up a couple hundred feet, then you start making contact with the guy who's out there really getting shot at. And um, you get on scene, you let him know who you are, which one you are, that you're the aircraft commander. If he's a little anxiety stricken, and sometimes they are, they're screaming on the radio and you can't understand him, you've got to calm him down first of all to control the situation and make sure he's going to give you the proper directions to where he wants you to suppress because if he's confused and gives you the wrong directions, he says east and means west, you may completely take out his squad or his platoon. So that's kind of what you do. At what, what point would they use a, a fighter aircraft versus a helicopter in an airstrike? I mean, what determines which craft you use? Normally, if, if there are a lot of troops in the open or a, a big area, uh, you know, couple football fields and they're kind of entrenched in, in the bushes or the trees or hiding behind the dikes and stuff. They'll come in with like napalm, something that's a massive uh, personnel killer, take, take out a whole area at once, or they'll come in with flechettes. We used to even carry flechettes in our, um, in our helicopters. Uh, very few people even know what those are. And they're called nails and it's like a little arrow. And just picture a little Oh, about a four or five penny nail and you cut the head off and put little fins on it. But you lay 17 to 25,000 of these things per, per warhead and you shoot them out of the helicopter and about 100 yards out there you see a little poof of red smoke and that means that the, the thing has, the warhead has exploded and now all the nails just float and gravity pulls them down and they all uh, aerodynamically hit whatever's down there and it was a silent death and it was it was pretty treacherous stuff. It was an interesting weapon. They even used them in artillery weapons when you were being assaulted, when you were being overrun. It was a last ditch effort, but it was it was quite a weapon. What do you call that? A flechette? A flechette. Wow. Now you never carried napalm? No. No. And it's a jelly like flamethrower substance? I never messed with napalm. I basically know what it is, but to, to try and have a... How about Agent Orange? Did you ever carry that? No. Who, no. Would, who, would, who would spray that, or which kind of aircraft would do that? Those, they used a lot of the Hueys and a lot of Air Force bombs and things like that, but a lot of the Hueys were spraying that, and they also did it in, in trucks. You know, just like mosquito sprayers. Those poor guys. But I didn't get that. Do you have many Vietnam friends? Vietnam? No. Does your daughter know much about your experience in Vietnam? Not much. Yeah. Do you want her to know? Someday, I guess, yeah, when she's curious enough to ask me about it. She knows I'll talk about it. You know, she's heard me have conversations with a few folks because in the aviation industry here in, in Denver, you know, there are a few of us still flying or who have been flying that we'll get together and we'll chat once in a while. but. Nothing lengthy. Are there things maybe you've told me today you've not told her or, or people for a long time? Or, I mean, is this the first time maybe for some of this? All, almost everything I've told you, I haven't spoken. I just, I don't belong to the VFWs. I, I, don't, I don't participate in any of those veteran affairs. It, it just brings up the bad memories too, you know. You think there's things that happen in war to veterans, and I've talked to a lot of them, and I would have to say the answer to this is yes, but do you, do you think there are things that you just forget about because they were so bad and that's part of that human mechanism to, to stay sane? I don't know. I mean, I think life in general. Don't you think there's things in combat and war that you're probably going to take to the grave with you? You're not going to tell anybody. Absolutely. But that, you're, you're correct. That happens in life, too. If it's a real traumatic, bad situation, maybe our mind just does it as a... A safety mechanism. Let's blot that out. It's too bad to think about. Sure. Because I am not trying to pull anything bad out of you or anybody. I'm not after the blood and guts of war, like mm -hmm. I said this morning at Nine News. But I'm after the personal side of what happened. How did it change you? What it felt like? What it looked like? 
what it smelled like, you know, just some of these things at that, that young age. It's, it's an amazing story that I hear. Well, it's also amazing that after you do a mission and you've been shot at and had a really rough night and you come back, it, it's, it's amazing you'll be lying there in bed and just almost, is this real? I mean, did I really just do this? And you've been over there for months. And every once in a while, you'll still have that dream, you know, a dream of a dream, you know, or, or wondering, is this real? Because it's so crazy. You're doing things over there that you can't even imagine, and then you're doing them. So. When you came home, did you have any sort of homecoming, or was it like a lot of experiences I've heard, a very negative reaction? Well, when I landed in California, I actually, um, instead of coming home to Denver right away, I took a full week. I had some friends that I had grown up with, and they were out there. So I just wanted to acclimate for a week by myself, just to see how it was. And then I came back, and then I was able to, and I'm glad I did that, because it was, it was good to get grounded. Are you proud, Vic, that you're a Vietnam veteran? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have people thanked you for your service? Yes. How yes. did that make you feel when that happened? Almost embarrassed. And thanking me for being patriotic. You know, thanking me for doing what my dad did, what so many other Americans have done. I'm appreciative that they're thankful because there were so many that weren't, and it's taken so long to finally hear that. I would have loved to have heard it back when I came back. I would have really loved that. That didn't happen too much. Family members, a few friends, but uh, it's nice now to, to, get, to get the appreciation shown. Well, I'm intrigued by your story and, and having done what you did. I've been in a helicopter twice. Whoopee. But I enjoyed it. I just imagine. And when I hear helicopters, I think of like the Air Life helicopters. They, to me, they're, they're reminiscent of maybe what the Huey sounded like, the wop wop. But um, I'm, I'm always just very amazed by how it works and the whole thing. And I always think about that. Well, and interesting that you bring up Air Life because St. Anthony's Flight for Life was the very first civilian program for that. And I was their first pilot. Uh, well, there were four of us original pilots, but what a difference to go from, my job was to shoot people all year long, and then to come back here and be able to go out and push yourself the same way, but to save people. That was a wonderful program. Very taxing, very trying. All of us lost our wives. <laughs> it was amazing. Let's do one more thing. At the end of my interviews, I always ask the veteran to give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated. When I tell you, can you do that? Sure. When you see one of my documentaries, you'll understand why I do this. It's done very gracefully. So. I actually saw it on the end of uh, the show today. Did they show something? Yeah. Okay, sir, go ahead. All right, thank you.